G'day, I'm Alex Bainbridge. Welcome to The Green F Show. I'm here today with David Roby, New Zealand author and journalist, and we're talking about the, uh, the current Kanak revolt, uh, the independent struggle in Kanaki or New Caledonia. Before we get underway, I wanted to acknowledge that this is being recorded on stolen First Nations land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, and we pledge our solidarity with ongoing struggles for, for justice. Also, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter if you're not already. Uh, plans start from just $5 a month, and it is the number one way that you can support our work and also to receive the content that we produce. And there's information in the video description or the podcast description or online wherever you're getting this uh, Green Left show. Now, David, uh, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're in a situation where for the last two weeks there's been a revolt by Kanak people. Uh, against moves by the French colonial power to try and weaken and undermine uh, what has been a, seen as a long-running pathway towards independence. Could you begin just by laying out a, a sort of a basic introduction to the issues involved and what has been happening? Well, basically, it's uh, it had been portrayed in the media as, as just a sudden uh, eruption, but uh, it's been a long time uh, uh, building up to this, um, uh, essentially, uh, Kanak uh, Indigenous uh, people uh, feel that they've been betrayed. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the uh, Kanak officials that I've been in touch with uh, um, used the word the robbery. That she's basically said, uh, you know, we've we've been robbed of our independence because of the French policies at the moment. Um, the things were set in place really uh, back in uh, 2021. When uh, the third uh, referendum, the, uh, well, maybe I should jump back just even a little bit further because um, we had all the uh, uh, really similar upheaval in many ways to now in the 1980s, and that stretched on for probably about five years in you know, a rather sporadic way. Um, and that led to uh, eventually a massacre on Luvia Island, uh, where something like uh, 19 Kanaks were, were massacred by uh, French uh, troops. Uh, after a hostage drama, which was fi the final episode probably of that period, um, which led to the Montagnon Accords in 1988. That was the peace accord to bring uh, uh, some, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, resolution for the time being at that period. And then 10 years later, there was the new uh, Numir Accord, uh, 1998, uh, which really paved the way for... Um, self-determination and uh, projected independence. Um, and that was very peaceful from then on, uh, right up until the three referendums on independence that were part of the uh, Numia Accord. Um, and uh, the first referendum uh, was in um, uh, two, uh, 2018. And at that point, uh, the vote against it uh, was against independence but surprisingly uh not not very high like it was just over 50 percent um uh and uh 50 50 uh, 54 percent i think it was at the time um uh, 50 57 percent in fact um and uh, uh the the projections from the french side was that oh well we're, we're going to easily win this uh referendum um uh, we're projecting sort of like something like about a 70 percent vote so they're completely shocked by by the result now, two years later, there was the second referendum and the vote for independence went up, but it wasn't over the 50%, but it, uh, but it uh, went up another 3%. So it was very really close to 50%. And when, given that the demographics are very much against the uh, indigenous uh, population, um, this was very hopeful. Well, then, of course, we came to the third referendum, uh, 2021, and uh, the FNKS, uh, Karnak uh, pro-independence uh, movement and so on, uh, decided that they were going to boycott um, that referendum because of um, the, in the tail end of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it was enormous consequences for the Indigenous people. Uh, many lost their lives uh, during during that uh, period. Um, and uh, under custom, um, there's mourning for a year and so the FNK has asked, look, you know, uh, asked the French government, uh, can we hold off? Can we um, delay the um, uh, referendum uh, until we're able to sort of um, uh, basically uh, mobilise and, uh, and uh, prepare for that referendum? Well, of course, Fr France at that point said no, no. Uh, and so the FNK has then appealed to the Constitutional Court uh, and they were rejected. 
And so from then on, basically, things have uh, really nosedived. And there were warnings right back in 2021. Well, um, you're really going to be risking heading back to the, you know, standoff in the 1980s, you know, and uh, seemed to be a very uh, uh, bloody-minded uh, position of the French government on this, you know. And, uh, of course, the politicians, the French politicians, I think, were reasonably... Uh, committed to the decolonization process previously to 2020, but there were changes then of the personnel and the Macron uh, government responsible for New Caledonia. And uh, those, uh, particularly uh, the most recent one, uh, Gérard uh, de Manin, um, he, uh, he was very bloody-minded um, and uh, had very little respect from the uh, Karak population. So this all basically led up to... The other aspect, which is about uh, what's been reported in the media as uh, electoral reform. Well, I reject that term reform as an absolutely retrograde step. And that in itself uh, was bound to cause a, a major eruption um, because what was uh, uh, what's involved in that is an unfreezing of the electoral rolls so that uh, prior to when under the 1998 uh, Numia Court, um, voting was restricted to those uh, uh, French uh, settlers and so on uh, that were already in New Caledonia prior to that to date, and uh, all Indigenous uh, Canucks, of course. Um, but the new changes that were being planned was to grant uh, all those who have been living in New Caledonia for the t 10 years continuously would then have the right to vote. And, of course, that's been portrayed um both in France and uh, and even in, around the region in the Pacific, as oh well, this is democracy, you know, we we one person one vote sort of thing, but it entirely uh, rejects the notion that Indigenous people have the right to uh, self determine uh, to you know to self determination on their future, um, and so uh, quite rightly the um, um, Kanak uh, people have seen this as an absolute betrayal. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the Macron government has just been digging its heels in, and uh, uh, and 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 sort of uh, not being prepared to really uh, resolve this issue. Um, we've had um, uh, President uh, Macron came in, uh, flew in for a day last week, Thursday, um, and but unfortunately, many of the predictions before his visit were that he was going to bring a high-profiled uh, mission for dialogue. Um, and people, including in that mission, would be people that had some, uh, uh, well, basically, the Canucks to have confidence in. And some of the names that were being mentioned were um, uh, people like uh, Emmanuel um, Philippe, who was prime minister up until 2020. And he seemed to have a pretty good handle on indigenous issues in the Pacific and particularly with New Caledonia. So I think there's a lot of trust in him. And then way back, uh, another previous prime minister was Lionel uh, Jospin, who was responsible for um, the 1998 Numia Accord. So I think there was a fair amount of trust in him as well. But unfortunately, um, uh, Macron arrived in uh, Numia, and who should be with him but uh, Damien and uh, also his um, pre previous, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, his pre predecessor, who was uh, Sebastien Lecourneau, and um, so both of them were there. And, of course, uh, to see them alongside uh, President Macron, um, President Macron has actually was um, not, um, Canucks were not very happy about that at all. And they realised that, well, there's, there's no real commitment to uh, uh, sort of uh, negotiation here and, uh, and, and having a consensus. Yeah. In relation to that, how do you assess the current imperialist goals of the French government? Like, what are they trying to achieve here? Well, I think uh, basically uh, they've lost the plot. Uh, they've, they've like um, essentially they've uh, lost uh, um, uh, commitment to the decolonization process, which had been going on really since 1998 until 2020. From then on, things really have sp uh, spiraled downhill, and I think uh, uh, the position now of Macron is we want. Uh, especially with the uh, evolution, if you like, of the Indo-Pacific uh, policy that uh, that they have. They see um, very much uh, uh, New Caledonia as an integral part of uh, France's role in the Pacific now. So basically, they've ditched the um, 
uh, commitment to um, self-determination that had been the case earlier. Now, you recently told Eugene Doyle that there has to be a consensus, otherwise the only option is civil war. What hope do you think there is for consensus, and is it possible to achieve a mediated outcome as the FLNKS have called for in their recent statement? Yes, well, I think you know a consensus is, is really uh, vital, but at this stage right now, uh, it's very hard to see um, uh, w you know how to achieve any kind of consensus because uh, nobody's talking to each other. Essentially, <laughs> when uh, Macron uh, arrived in New Caledonia, he had various meetings with all the different parties, uh, but he never had a single meeting with everybody at the table together, sort of thing. Um, so he has failed in the sense that uh, he wasn't able to get any sort of um, uh, dialogue happening. Uh, although he's got a mission in place now to to uh, encourage dialogue, the problem there is that um, the FNKS side see that uh, Macron is biased. Um, the French state is actually biased. It's it, Previously, the policy seemed to be that um, the state the French state was was like an arbiter, if you if you like, between uh, both uh, those the loyalist sides who want to stay French and those who want independence and be part of the Pacific. Um, and now the sense is over the last two or three years that uh, that uh, uh, the government in, in, in Paris uh, is really uh, biased in favour of the pro-French sides. Now, of course, um, that's the general overall picture, um, but it's a, even more complicated than that because um, even within uh, both sides, there are big divisions as well. So you've got uh, you've got three main uh, pro uh, pro uh, sorry anti-independence uh, uh, parties, and they don't see eye to eye. And then we've got the FNKS as an umbrella group. You know that was formed in the 1980s, and that uh, um, you know as part of that group, the several uh, parties of the biggest is uh, the Union in Caledonia. Um, and uh, for, um, last year, uh, a new group was formed uh, largely from uh, members of the Caledonian Union, um, which is the CAT, which is the Field uh, Action Groups uh, and so on. They've been described, I saw in a newspaper today, uh, one of the news agencies reported, the, uh, reported them as a political party. Uh, they're not really, they're, 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 they're a group that is largely um, uh, encouraged spontaneous action from uh, last year. And so they were actually separate from the FNKS about um, uh, really uh, catering with particularly young young people and so on. Um, so that's there another uh, picture because they've also been making statements uh, since uh, Macron's visit. The FNKS um, came uh, came, uh, came came out with a statement. Um, in fact, I might I just uh, quickly um, some of the key points of what the FNKS have been saying. Um, well, they made a point of saying that well, you know, the problem was that uh, they had uh, that Macron had uh, bilateral sort of talks, but he ex uh, well, at least they exclude he excluded the presence of uh, Luc Honneau and uh, Damina. But they they were in the background um, and obviously um, uh, influencing uh, Macron. Um, they said that that essentially that uh, response needs to come uh, politically uh, and not through repression. Um, in fact, I've just been watching a video um, just overnight uh, from the French government showing uh, their uh, mobile, you know, gendarmerie sort of uh, in action trying to uh, remove. Um, uh, barricades, etc. And it sort of looks like something out of a war movie, you know, <laughs> incredible. But anyway, the repression is not the way to go. Um, and uh, they want the complete withdrawal of this draft constitutional uh, law. Uh, I should mention that that law, uh, the stage that it's reached, it's, it's been, been adopted by the Senate, it's been adopted by the National Assembly, but then there has to be a, a Congress, which is a combination of uh, both houses, to vote on that. But it's pretty well a foregone conclusion that they've got, they've got the numbers to support that. At the moment, uh, Macron has put a pause on it, um, but he's certainly not made any commitment uh, to, to withdraw it, and that's what the FNKs want. Um, of course, the the French, the pro-French groups, the loyalist groups, they want they want that vote. They want that uh, because they know that they'll be able to sort of uh, swamp the um, FNKS vote. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why the young people have um, uh, mounted uh, protests and uh, gone on a rampage in a way 
um, is they see, well, you know, the, the writing's on the wall. If this um, law really comes into effect and it, uh, it'll take its effect in the next uh, uh, provincial elections, which are supposed to be later this year, um, they, they're going to have no hope of independence uh, based on, on that uh, arrangement, especially with the, uh, the, their demographics are only 42% of the population in New Caledonia. It's a, a population 270,000 or so. Um, anyway, just to get back to the FNKS um, uh, statement, they said that um, they they need they want a an international uh, a mediation group. So they want it made up of um, high profile people from France that they believe can be, have a neutral, like a, basically a sort of a uh, an arbiter's um, role, if you like. But they want they rep want representation from the Pacific as well, um, and. Um, they um, they they basically are sort of very unhappy with uh, a lot of the statements made by the uh, French uh, High Commissioner um, and also Domino and so on, who basically described uh, the activists as thugs and terrorists and so on. So um, with that sort of language, uh, that inflammatory sort of language, uh, it shows that um, Paris is not really uh, wanting to listen. Um, now the the, the C CCAT group uh, led by Christian Tien. Um, they're, they're taking a slightly different position. Uh, obviously, they want that uh, draft uh, law uh, withdrawn, but he, um, uh, Tian has actually made a statement on video. He's under house arrest, of course. He let the leaders fall under house arrest to try and uh, uh, shut them up, uh, but of course that doesn't succeed. Uh, he's made a video statement, um, and uh, he's called on... Uh, the young uh, followers and that sort of thing to maintain their barricades uh, because this is the only time we can uh, got a chance to, to, to sort of do it. Um, and uh, but to release uh, le le to basically uh, to loosen up a bit on the barricades to allow uh, people to get through for uh, necessities, uh, food, uh, health, and, uh, and and so on. Uh, but they're certainly, certainly going to maintain the barricades. And of course, there's something like three thousand uh, security forces now in New Caledonia. Um, which is showing the uh, the role that uh, Paris is going to take. So put a bottle on this, we repress it. Um, but as soon as they take uh, down barricades, and others spring up. A lot of the media reports have focused on violence um, and obscuring the fact that a lot of that violence is actually French colonial crackdown. What would you say to people who focus on the issue of violence in abstract, ignoring the underlying issues? Um, well, um, I, I think the uh, media coverage generally has been abysmal. Um, I haven't seen so much of Australian coverage, but it's certainly here in New Zealand, it's been absolutely appalling. Uh, the, 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 the major newspaper in New Zealand, for example, New Zealand Herald, never even ran any stories for the first three days. Um, then um, the next uh, couple of days, they woke up to the fact that this was happening right on our doorstep. Uh, New Caledonia is our closest neighbour in the Pacific. Uh, it's only a three-hour uh, flight, you know, to get to Noumea. And to think that this uh, this was the most major news event, I think, in the Pacific this year, uh, up until the uh, uh, the landslide in Papua New Guinea over, uh, last Friday. But um, politically, uh, this was the most uh, um, uh, biggest upheaval in the Pacific. And for New Zealand media to more or less ignore it, uh, and the Herald only picked up some stories from news agencies and, and so on, and the focus has been largely about, oh, well, you know, we have something like uh, 270 people, um, the, the tourists and visitors in New Caledonia. So the coverage has all been race based around that. And in fact, two of the major stories that did eventually get covered uh, by the New Zealand Herald never even mentioned independence, uh, let alone the, uh, the draft law that's just causing all the, uh, the, the crisis at the moment. Um, so there's no real attempt by media to uh, um, report on the the, 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 the issues. And so the, the overwhelming the impression is, oh, New Caledonia is sort of overrun by thugs and so on, and are causing uh, risks and dangers to um, the tourists. Oh, sad for the tourists. You've said that there is a global failure of neocolonialism in relation to Palestine, West Papua and Kanaki. Can you talk more about that? Well, I think that uh, um, in what's happening in Gaza is uh, absolutely uh, uh, shocking and uh, uh, disturbing uh, for growing numbers of people around the world. You know, we all can see daily 
uh, the genocide that's unhappening. And we see that as a result of uh, settler colonialism. 76 years of settler colonialism in uh, Israel is finally, um, you know, the, 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 the facade the mirage around uh, uh, Israel is is, is broken. Um, even if uh, Western leaders, uh, particularly US and so on, um, can't actually see this, the people can. And uh, increasingly, uh, people are seeing the connections uh, very clearly in a way that uh, was a very marginalized viewpoint probably before. So you see some, for example, in our region, uh, it's not only Palestine, we've had uh, massive demonstrations every week now, since the uh, um, Israel um, Israeli war began on Gaza, um, and uh, really gets co covered, you know, but there are thousands taking part. There are places, pr protests all over New Zealand, you know, about 20, 20, between 20 and 25 places each week, you know, this has gone on, and it's, uh, this, is un this is unprecedented. And even during the uh, uh, peace uh, rallies um, over um, the uh, US um, uh, invasions of uh, Iraq and so on, we never had that sustained level of, uh, of, de of a protest. And increasingly, people are becoming aware and uh, educated. Um, and so uh, the marginalised views around uh, Kanaki, for example, and also um, around West Papua, uh, people are starting to sort of understand what uh, what's behind all this now, really. It's about resources, resource extraction and, um, and settler colonialism generally. And... Uh, you know, this is a very sensitive issue in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, because we have at the moment a very right-wing government uh, that is hell-bent on trying to uh, re-legislate um, our uh, fundamental document, uh, our Magna Carta, if you like, uh, the um, you know, uh, Tari Tariti, the, the Treaty of Waitangi uh, from 1840. I mean, that's the underlying document that uh, most of us uh, accept as our foundation, you know, um, but the current government uh, is is trying to to erode this, um, uh, and so we've got the people. We've got the people out on the streets, you know, week after week, uh, protesting about uh, settler colonialism. It comes up in uh, uh, speeches and and uh, discussions all the time. And then you've got governments that are just certainly not listening to the people. Actually, can you unpack more about this question of resource extraction and imperialist interests in in relation to Kanaki? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the fundamental one in uh, New Caledonia is particularly um, about uh, well, some mining mining issues. Uh, uh, nickel. Uh, New Caledonia is the third um, uh, largest producer of uh, uh, nickel in, in the world, but the the, the industry has collapsed in, in essence. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, inefficient in many respects and very expensive uh, for the extraction of uh, nickel. Uh, and although the, over during the, the Numea Accord, there were efforts to sort of decentralise and uh, and to uh, enable uh, Kanak investment. Uh, for example, there's a nickel um, uh, mine in the north of uh, New Caledonia, and so that very, had a very strong stake of the uh, uh, independence uh, movement and support and so on. But essentially, it's 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 collapsed, and there's a, a high unemployment, uh, up to a fifty percent unemployment now in that industry. And the problem has been for New Caledonia is uh, competition from uh, Indonesia and China in particular. Um, but also there are other other areas. Uh, that one of the reasons that uh, it's felt that France wants to uh, maintain uh, con control of, of course, its uh, its uh, economic uh, zone uh, in the ocean as well, a uh, massive uh, area, and of course that applies with the uh, uh, French quote unquote uh, Polynesia. Um, so um, that's, that's some of the issues around that. And uh, um, France has actually developed a plan to rescue the uh, nickel industry, uh, the nickel mining industry and so on, in uh, New Caledonia. But uh, the FNKS, the Karnaks, basically see that as a, another neo-colonial uh, measure that will distance themselves further from having any control of their own economy. Uh, because one of the things that really strikes you when you visit uh, New Caledonia, especially you go to Numea, you have to get out into the um, countryside and so on. But if you just go to Numea, you, you, you're confronted by this very opulent looking uh, um, Mediterranean style um, uh, white city uh, and a lot of affluence. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you've got uh, many of the, the tribu areas around the outskirts of uh, uh, Numea uh, with this incredible poverty. And uh, the disparity between the two is, is quite shocking. 
So what demands do you think we should be placing on the New Zealand and Australian governments in the current circumstances? Well, I think that is, yeah, yeah. Well, I think Australia, Australia and New Zealand should very much be uh, part of the uh, uh, support from the Pacific Islands uh, Forum and the Melanesian uh, Spearhead uh, uh, Group. And of course, they've all both come out with statements in support of uh, dialogue uh, to uh, and and also to withdraw that uh, uh, legislation. But uh, I don't see that Australia and New Zealand have been making statements. <laughs> you know, I mean, like. They're basically they're not they're not going to well certainly Australia is not going to interfere with uh, what it sees as France and its Indo Pacific uh, policy, which is fits very nicely with uh, um, Australia even under Labour, you know, which is uh, sad to see. Um, and uh, we have a right wing government in uh, New Zealand now, a coalition government, a very unwieldy one, uh, which um, seems to be pulling New Zealand closer to uh, the Washington uh, sort of uh, um, clique, if you like, um, and less uh, focus on the Pacific that we've had traditionally, especially uh, many of us see our nuclear-free policy as under, under threat with um, uh, the current uh, New Zealand government's policies, partly because they're not even um, uh, consulting the country or even uh, uh, make, being transparent about uh, what the policies, particularly over AUKUS, uh, you know, and the uh, discussion around uh, us uh, joining the pillar two um, uh, bracket. So a lot of there's a lot of unease and, and concern about that. So just getting back to your question, um, New Zealand and Australia should really get behind uh, uh, the Pacific Islands Forum and come out and be outspoken and uh, say, look, you know, we, we need we need a, a, a mission uh, in New Caledonia that does have some Pacific representation. Uh, that's uh, vital, uh, vital. It's 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 more than just a, 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 a sort of decision between uh, uh, French citizens and uh, the French uh, state. It's a whole fundamental issue around decolonization and self-determination for the indigenous Karnak people. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much for your time, David Roby, and thanks to you for joining us today on The Green F Show. As I said at the beginning, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green F supporter. It is the number one way to support the work that we do, plus to uh, receive the content that we produce. Plans start from just $5 a month, and you can find out more in the link in this video description or at this podcast. Um, if you like the work that we do, please become a supporter. Remember also you can uh, support us just by sharing this video or this podcast. Um, share your friends, tell us about it, tell your friends about it, give us a thumbs up, uh, and we will see you next time on The Green Air Show.